Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma pig slopping in 46. Oh, every Christmas we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And this episode is brought to you by BYU TV's Relative Race, Sunday nights at 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific. Oh, another big episode coming up this weekend, this Sunday night. Hey, welcome to the show. Great to have you along. We've got some great guests today, as always. First of all, we're going to bring you some hope for those people who are who are worried genealogists, worried about what's going to happen to their stuff, all their research, all their papers, because millennials just aren't paying attention. They're just not interested. There is hope. And we're going to talk to renowned genealogist Amy Johnson Crow about what she's learned about future generations and their interest in genealogical information coming up in about 10 minutes or so. Later in the show, Tammy and Kyle Mullen will be here. They're from upstate New York and, and put together an amazing book for their local area. It gives us a great idea of what any of us could do to honor our veterans from our hometowns with their book on World War I soldiers, how they did it, what got them interested in it, some of the stories they learned, great stuff. Stuff. And then at the back end of the show, it's our Ask Us Anything segment on DNA this week. We're going to talk to Paul Woodbury from Legacy Tree Genealogists and answer some of those commonly asked questions. But right now, let's head off to Boston and talk to my good friend, David Allen Lambert. He is the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. David, I got to tell you, I had quite the week because I got I one of those know. phone calls. One of those phone calls. Here I am with my wife. It's the first nice evening of spring on a Saturday night. So I'm, I'm eating dinner at a restaurant with my wife and my son and my daughter-in-law and the phone rings and it's my half second cousin from Connecticut. He never calls on a Saturday night. We're good buddies. We've been research mm -hmm. pals for like 13 years now and he always finds this stuff and he found the only known photograph original of my great-grandfather, our common great-grandfather, who was a firefighter. And we'd found tiny ones in group pictures before of him in the firefighting gear. But this is the first full-size picture, and it is absolutely flawless. And it was quite a thrill. And he also found a little piece of ephemera from the volunteer fire department from back in 1885 that was in this box with it that he didn't even know he had. So it was a pretty cool day. I think that's genealogical dessert before the actual dessert. Yes. That's wonderful. I was just about to take my first bite, and I said, hey, before you even scan it, text it to me. i got to see this. And we're sitting at an outdoor table and just showing the picture around to everybody, and everybody was just awed. I had been looking for a picture like that of this guy for 38 years, so that was a, a real kick to find that. All right, let's get started with Family Histoire News today. What do we have, David? Well, I want to lead off saying that sometimes DNA tests for an engaged couple may not always turn out really well. This isn't the case where they're actually finding out they're close cousins. <laughs> it's because of his ancestor. Did you see that one? Yeah, this is kind of interesting. This couple did a DNA test, and he finds out that his direct ancestor was a serial killer. A serial killer. And so yeah. as a result of this, <laughs> the girlfriend, the fiance, says, I'm sorry, I cannot marry you because maybe you have some tendencies of this person. And, and she left. He killed the engagement. Literally. The engagement. Yeah, he killed it. all, the, And he's dead. He's been dead for a long time. So, uh, yeah, they, he posted this on social media, the former groom-to-be, and uh, lots of people saying, oh, well, this girl isn't worth it because <laughs> if that bothers her, then there's really a fundamental issue anyway. You know, families can break up marriages. Whoever thought a great, great, great something could cause a marriage to Right. Go figure. Yeah. Well, this is kind of fun. We know in the news. Golden State Killer has been everywhere lately. However, BuzzFeed employees kind of got in on the act. So what happened is one of the employees decided to take DNA from 
the staff, and then run it against GEDmatch, and then from there determine which ones they were. And right. they did a pretty good job at it. They did. They assigned one reporter all this DNA and, and said, okay, see if you can figure out who the employees are. And using everything from ethnicity reports to close matches and digitized newspapers, she figured out who six of the ten were using GEDmatch. Unbelievable. It really is. We obviously had news recently about Notre Dame, but even now, local fires have great implications as well. But there may be some good news on this one. Um, This week, unfortunately, in Loudoun County, Tennessee, a 19th century courthouse has burned, and it looks like it's almost a total loss. But... 80 to 90 percent of the records fish were actually out being cataloged recently by a historian. Wow. So they weren't in the building. Sweet. And, you know, it really is. And, you know, the thing about it is, I, and I, I, I always tip my hat to family search for the decades of going out to courthouses and doing probates and deeds and guardianship records, whatever they could get their hands on, we really are indebted to the work they did. And now with the digital age, something like this, the records might be gone, but because of family search, they're still existing. That's right. It really is a great thing. That is a story that's on ExtremeGenes.com, as well as this one. And this is by Elizabeth Thomas, who's going to Georgetown University. Unlike a lot of the graduates, she has a connection with Georgetown. No, her dad wasn't a professor. Her ancestors were enslaved people owned by the university and sold. Yeah, and so this is part of a program Georgetown has put together to help make up for what they did institutionally back in the 1850s. So she's going to be graduating soon. Well, my blogger spotlight this week shines on Claire Santry. Claire is a blogger who runs IrishGenealogyNews.com. And this very active blog touches upon all sorts of things in your Irish genealogical spectrum of interest, including recent news about 13,300 early Irish birth marriages and deaths that have been added online. So take a peek at her blog and uh, give it some love. So I'm going to wrap up before I fly off to Alaska to lecture up in Anchorage this weekend. (laughs) Yeah, go from Virginia warm to Alaska (laughs) chilly. But I want to say if you're not a member of American Ancestors, uh, you can go to our website and save $20 on membership by using the coupon code EXTREME. All right, Catch David. you soon, my friend. All right, Hope you, you too, get some buddy. more phone calls during dinner. Yes, I would like that. <laughs> Anytime. All right, and coming up next, Amy Johnson Crow talking about why we shouldn't give up on millennials and other younger generations when it comes to passing down our information. It's on the way in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Hey, Genies, it is Fisher here. And do you have a photograph problem on your hands? I mean, like five or 10,000 nostalgic pre-digital snapshots. Well, now it's extra affordable to use ScanMyPhotos.com, the company which professionally has digitized 600 million pictures. And they can now scan your pictures for as little as one cent each. Yeah, one cent. They got the idea after a recent Oprah magazine profile on them. Yeah, they're big time. Readers were explaining they had thousands Thousands of pictures to scan, and we're looking for a more affordable way to scan pictures. So with ScanMyPhotos.com, you can scan 10,000 pictures for as little as $100. And by the way, save 20% on their most popular service, their prepaid photo scanning box that includes same-day scanning and all extra add-ons. And to access it all, of course, the promo code is ExtremeGenes. That's ScanMyPhotos.com, promo code ExtremeGenes. Finally, a solution. Roots Tech 2019 may be over, but the Family History Fund doesn't have to end. Visit RootsTech.org to view recorded content from the event. Rewatch the inspiring keynote addresses from celebrity speakers Patricia Heaton, Saru Briley, and Jake Shimabukuru. A number of classes are also available to view for free from popular genealogists such as Miko Cleland, Diane Southard, and Valerie Elkins. Want access to even more content from Roots Tech? Purchase the virtual 
virtual pass and get access to 18 recorded conference sessions. Watch playbacks from any device from the comfort of your own home. Enjoy exclusive content from popular presenters like Kenyatta Berry, D. Joshua Taylor and Lisa Louise Cook. Purchase your all-access virtual pass at rootstech.org for only $129. Roots Tech 2019 may be over, but it lives on through the Roots Tech Virtual Pass. Download yours today. Visit rootstech.org to learn more. Hey, Janies, Fisher here, and day seven from this season's relative race on BYU TV is in the books. Only three more days left to go till we find out who wins the $50,000. And a lot more answers for our teams this week. Of course, you know, Team Black was eliminated the week before, but that didn't stop Kaylee and Kristen from still meeting one last family member in Hayes, Virginia. Meanwhile, Demetrius of Team Blue actually got to meet a cousin on his father's side and see a picture of his grandfather for the first time. So he's collecting a lot of great information on his mysterious dad's side. And Team Green wound up in St. George, Utah, where it was a rather bizarre meeting with a brother to Marcus. And on Team Red, Liz met her father for the first time and received a little bit of resolution. You don't want to miss a minute of this episode or any others. That's why you got to catch the show Sunday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific on BYU TV. Or you can stream it on BYUtv.org or by using the BYU TV app. You know, I think a lot of us genies worry about what's going to happen in the future. You know, we spend so much time researching our family and trying to find photographs and save videos and write histories. But who's going to want this stuff? What's going to happen to it? Is it going to be thrown out on the trash bin? Hey, it's Fisher. It's your host here for Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. And I'm excited to bring to you Amy Johnson Crow, my good friend, who says to us, we really shouldn't worry too much about it. How are you, Amy? Welcome back to Extreme Genes. Well, hey, Scott. Thanks for having me back. You know, I'm glad that we have you on because I think we all need a little reassurance about this because since I started in my 20s doing this, I've heard my whole life about who's going to be interested, who's going to want this. I became that person, but I didn't become that person till my late 20s. What do you have to say about millennials now and how they deal with family history? You know, one thing that I think that we need to consider first is who are the millennials? Because I think that sometimes we're grouping everybody who's under the age of, say, 50. <laughs> we're kind of grouping them all together as millennials. And we see, you know, high schoolers and whatnot. But really, the youngest millennials are like 19. Mm -hmm. So when you're seeing, you know, junior high kids and high school kids running around, they aren't the millennials. They don't qualify. Millennials. They, they don't qualify. And I've seen various names given for this most recent generation, but the millennials are generally, let's say, you know, 19, 20 years old, all the way up through the 30s. Yes. So these are young adults. They are currently getting married. They are starting families. They're pursuing their careers. And it's a really busy time of life for them. It's, it's a very busy season of life for them. You know, so, I think this is really the case where we speak to anybody about, you know, learning genealogy. It's making the time. And in many cases, the reasons why it's older people who are in the family history, it's because they have the time. And I think the one thing that we need to think about when we're trying to find that younger person in the family who is interested, if we're showing this as an activity that you have to spend a lot of time on, they simply don't have the time. It's not that they don't care. You know, I was talking to my daughter about this, and my, my daughter is solidly a millennial. And I was talking to her about it, and she said, Mom, when I talk to my friends who are also millennials, they're interested in the stories. They love that connection, but they just don't have the time right now to be actively going out and researching generally speaking. Well, let's see. They've got school. They've got dating. They've got maybe mm -hmm. uh, early marriage. They've got young children, and they have careers. I'm sure they got yeah. plenty of time to go out and do all this, right? <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I often I... explain to people the reason I got into it so young was because I was doing morning radio at that time. 
And so my work day was over by 11 in the morning and I was near an archive, near a library. And so it made it really easy for me to do it at that time. Even when I had kids in school, they were at school in the middle of the day. So I could get started on this. And this is what made it spring so easily for me at that age. You know, I, I think that that's a, a pretty atypical situation yeah. where your work day is done so early in the morning and you happen to be near an archive and a library. Right. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, it yeah. just worked yeah. out that way. It was perfect. I think what we need to do, if we're wanting to find that next person who's going to pick up the mantle as the family historian, is instead of saying, hey, here's my four-door filing cabinet full of all of my notes, because that sounds exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we need to have a slightly more appealing approach to it. Say, hey, here's a photo album that I've put together. And here are the stories of these people who are your ancestors. Rather than saying, hey, here are these 14 three-ring binders that I've put together and <laughs> all of these notes. That's just not that appealing. No. And you know, the good news is, though, as we digitize all these things and put them into little folders online and just store them there, and then we share them using either Google Drive or Dropbox or something similar, all that stuff is preserved. I think it's a lot more of the language of their generation, for one thing. So if they do get into actually researching some of the details and the, the underlying documents behind some of these stories, those things are still there. They still survive. It is the documentation of all the work that you've done in your lifetime. And that stuff doesn't have to wind up in the trash because it's not taking up any room. Exactly. And I think, too, that if we do have those 3D objects that we want to share. Well, for example, I have a mirror that belonged to my maternal grandmother. It's one of the very few objects of hers that I have. But if I just have this mirror and I don't tell my son and my daughter, this is whose mirror it was and here's why it's special and here's what it means to me. If we don't tell them the stories behind it, well, when my time comes, they're probably just going to chuck this mirror because yep. it doesn't fit their decor. <laughs> but if we can tell why it's important, then I think it stands a much better chance of making it on to the next generation. You know, I kind of realized that not long ago and started creating a digital book on our heirlooms with a photo of what it is and the story of what it is. So that it's, it's almost like a manual when that time comes. One of the things we found recently was an old silver coffee pot. I mean, junk falling apart. And I found a note my mother had left back in the 80s. And it said, silver coffee pot was my grandparents' wedding gift in 1881. And it's like, oh, wow. suddenly this thing is really awesome. But that little note isn't necessarily going to survive another 20, 30, 40 years. So took a picture of the pot, put the story of it right there among all these others and kind of laid it out kind of fun. And now I have them packed up all these things in a tub where they're kind of all together and marked as heirlooms. But with the stories preserved that go with them, I think they have a much better chance of getting passed on to future generations. Yeah, I agree totally. And I love what you said about, you know, putting it in a format that's going to be a little more fun, a little more enjoyable rather than just, eh, here it is, just plain black and white. It's not a college dissertation, right? Right, definitely. And that that's really the challenge. You know, I, I think that we're all concerned about who that person is going to be. One thought is it's not always necessarily going to be your child or your grandchild. It might be a nephew or a niece or even a cousin's child who picks up the mantle. And that was the case for me on, on one of the branches of the family. My mother had a first cousin who was very into it. And all her stuff she sent to me before she passed away because she knew I was that person. She said, who else would want this? And so I'm just thinking these people will appear. And maybe if you're seeing the younger generation right now saying they don't care, maybe they don't care now. But it doesn't mean they won't care later. I think you're exactly right. I think that as people go further into their life, there tend to be these triggers, these milestone events that get people thinking, oh, what came before? And what can I do to discover it? What can I do to help pass it down? And maybe that's 
the birth of a child. Maybe it's, sadly, the loss of a parent. And until you have some of these more milestone events in your life, you might not have that trigger of going from being interested to being involved. I think what you have to do, though, is bridge that gap, right, between the time that uh, you may be passing this stuff along till the time they actually pick up an interest. You have to make sure that they understand this is not something to be thrown away or that this is something to be preserved elsewhere, maybe even in an archive, right, for somebody to come along later and find. Right. Let's say that you are in a situation where you truly have not identified anybody in the family who wants to actually take your research. Well, then that's when you start approaching libraries, archives, genealogy societies, and working with them to see what they might be interested in, what format it needs to be in, and what you can do to work together to preserve your research after you're gone. Yeah, and NEHGS is is well known for this. They take old family Bible records and they preserve the originals right there. So for people in that part of the country, well, actually for any part of the country, because they cover all of the United States, that would be an option. Plus, local and regional archives, universities is a great place to go as well. I I think you'd agree, Amy. I would agree. And I, I think that the key for any sort of archive society library that you might be thinking is a good fit for your collection is to start working with them sooner rather than later. Don't just have something in your will saying, oh, all of my papers will go to X and so society or X and so archive because that might not fit their collection. It might not be in a format that they can really accept. So if you spend just a little bit of time talking with them and working with them, you can usually get something figured out of exactly what you need to do to get that collection moved on to them. And, and, you know, I've got a granddaughter who will turn seven in June, and she's already deep in the weeds. And she lives in Florida. So what I do is once in a while I'll find a new picture, you know, a new old picture, and I'll drop it in an envelope because kids love getting mail. I mean, real (laughs) old-fashioned mail. So I'll just drop a little note, maybe on a three-by-five card, and say, as my family history helper, I found this new picture. Would you take care of it? And I'll stick it in the envelope and tell them who it is, and and they get so excited. Amy, great chatting with you. It's, It's nice to have a little hope that, you know, we're not alone. I think our parents thought the same of us, that we wouldn't care about this at some point, but we do, and the next generation will as well. She is Amy Johnson Crow. Follow her at amyjohnsoncrow.com. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Tammy and Kyle Mullen about their incredible research into World War I vets in their hometown and how you can do a similar type of project for any topic in five minutes on Extreme Genes. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chartmasters' option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chartmasters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chartmasters will give the greatest care to your family history. Big studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. 
ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Back at it, Genies. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes, at ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. Always excited to meet new people who are engaged in amazing projects that just further the cause so that people can find out about their ancestors and honor those who came before us, and especially our military people. And one person who has done this, actually a couple who have done this as a couple, Tammy and Kyle Mullen. They're in uh, Parma, New York, near Rochester, and they're on the line with me right now. Hi, Tammy. Hi, Kyle. How you guys doing? Hi, Scott. Hi, Scott. Great to have you on the show. What got you started in this project about the World War I guys in your neck of the woods? Well, Scott, back in the fall of 2016, the county historian offered a grant to any town that wanted to put together an artifact on their World War I veterans in honor of the 100th anniversary and to commemorate their service. Our local historian decided to put together quick biographies on the gentleman, and I ended up with 10 names. And as I started researching these 10 names, I uncovered absolutely amazing, fascinating stories. So when the information came through for the other 89 men, some of them were missing the stories, the depth to which I had uncovered information on the 10 men whose names that I was responsible for. So I took the project over and started researching. And as my husband told me from the beginning, Tammy, you research and write, and I've got the rest. Wow. And so I knew she was an overachiever, and she really wanted to (laughs) dig deep into these guys. Uh, So she kind of got coerced into doing all the research. But then at that point, when we started looking at it, we collected these names. And as she was doing the research, she's researching through a soda straw, looking at each person in depth. And then we backed out, and when we laid them all out, we found common themes. We found places where they had crossovers in their service, in their lives. Uh, We found families that were tied together. And it just became a really growing project. And as we used to say in the military, it was mission creep. You know, everything kept creeping more to more to (laughs) developing more about these stories. Wow. Did you relate to this a lot? I mean, you're a military man, Kyle. You were in the Air Force. Is that right? I was in the Air Force, yes, and so I actually did a crash course in World War I Army and Navy histories and the the construct of how the services were organized and everything that led up to the draft and how they got overseas. And it was an education for me as well, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, I bet you did. So have you found any descendants of some of these people living in your area? When the book project was started, um, I came to the decision that I wasn't going to reach out to family members because people's memories, their histories change over time. So the book was written solely on research, any published material through books, newspaper articles, reaching out to, you know, if I received a little nugget of information somewhere, then I would go to that university, that library, that town to uncover more information about it. You just didn't want old memories to taint what you were doing. And that's it's funny because we did use some locals that remembered some of the families to just to to corroborate we were on the right direction in the right family tree. And it was interesting to talk to some of the you know, including my father who knew a lot of the descendants of some of these World War One veterans and other members of the community that talked about, Oh, I remember that man, he was a cantankerous old fool or this guy had a <laughs> store on a certain street. So those were some great stories to get, but then we didn't use those stories, but we used those as the leads to do the research. Oh, what fun. Yeah, that's right. That's a great way to go with it. So you mentioned a book, Tammy. It started out as a community project. How did this evolve from that into your book? In the 10 men whose names I had researched, I found stories about how they lived their lives after the war. The book project initially started out birth, death, and what they did in the service. But the contributions of these men, once they left 
service were what I really wanted to focus on, what I really wanted to highlight was they did amazing and went through horrible experiences in the war, but how they turned that around and either serve their community through politics, through being farmers, through going into education, being lawyers. Those were the stories that these men overcame, whatever it was that they went through, to go on to have families and live amazing lives and make contributions and differences within the United States. Wow. Some of these men even went on to serve in World War II, believe it or not. They volunteered, they enlisted, and they went in a second time. And it was uncovering those stories just in those 10 men that told me there is so much more to this. There is so much more to the other 89, the total 99, where all the names came from. They're on a a 100-year-old painting that the town had commissioned to be painted back in 1919. It grew organically, and the, the project defined itself, and I really needed to get this information out there. And that's how it ended up becoming the book that it is. So what stories from some of these people struck you? Uh, One in particular, the gentleman's name was Douglas Newcomb. He is from Parma, and he went to school, received his degree in education, ended up moving to California. He was a math teacher in Long Beach, California, became principal and eventually superintendent of schools in Long Beach, California. He became so beloved, not just within the school system, but within his community, that when he retired, and he had spearheaded building California's first K-8 through combined school. They named that school after him. Oh, wow. So there is now what's called the Newcomb Academy in Long Beach, California, and it was named after one of our Parma World War I veterans. And just as a little side tidbit here, if anybody is familiar with the TV program Dexter, which takes place at a school, it's filmed at the Newcomb Academy. Interesting. Did you find a lot of the issues that we see with modern-day warriors who come back with PTSD and how it affected some of these people? And that was the thing that really I found interesting and kind of shocking in a way is I dug a little bit deeper into the military histories and the unit histories and where they were so I could understand what each of these soldiers had faced that were in France. And I really uncovered what is now modern-day post-traumatic stress disorder in a lot of these gentlemen. The Army was fascinating in how they did some very detailed reports on some of the shelling and some of the gas attacks. And that transcribed into why a lot of these gentlemen ended up in veterans-assisted living or VA hospitals in their later life. A lot of them succumbed to pneumonia or other lung-related issues because they had these exposures to gas, the shelling. We did have a few. You could tell based on reading between the lines that there were some post-traumatic stress disorder issues in their later life, psychological issues and that sort. So it was sad to read some of this, but it also kind of exposed that many people didn't realize that our local veterans had some of these exposures and some of these issues. But now that you read it, it makes sense when you see their early death dates as well. Yeah, and I don't think we uh, we hear much about the earlier wars and how it affected people years later. You started to hear some about the World War II vets later in their lives, and now we hear about it, of course, all the time for the, the Vietnam vets in particular. So you named the book With Our Boys, and Tammy, what's the story behind that title? Throughout the research, our local newspaper titled The Hilton Record Whenever there was a, information on any of the veterans, there would be a column, and the heading of the column was with our boys. And members of the community, if they had letters from their loved ones overseas or any kind of information, they would take it to the publisher, and he would put it in the newspaper under the column with our boys. The 100-year-old painting, which has the names of the 99 men on it, it's titled Honor Roll. So as we started working on the book and putting it together, we decided to put under the title with our boys, Honor Roll. Awesome. You know, it's a great story and obviously something that's consumed you guys and is going to leave a lasting mark on your town. And I appreciate your sharing the story. Kyle and Tammy Mullen, they're in Parma near Rochester, New York. And it's great to chat with you guys. Thanks for your time. It was wonderful to talk to you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks a lot. We talk DNA with Ask Us Anything coming up next on Extreme Genes.
Legacy Tree Genealogist is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've worked with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476 or register online to get a free estimate. Right now, you can save up to $100 on professional genealogy research. But hurry, this offer expires at the end of the month. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. Hey, Genies, it is Fisher here. And do you have a photograph problem on your hands? I mean, like five or 10,000 nostalgic pre-digital snapshots. Well, now it's extra affordable to use ScanMyPhotos.com, the company which professionally has digitized 600 million pictures. And they can now scan your pictures for as little as one cent each. Yeah, one cent. They got the idea after a recent Oprah magazine profile on them. Yeah, they're big time. Readers were explaining they had thousands Thousands of pictures to scan, and we're looking for a more affordable way to scan pictures. So with ScanMyPhotos.com, you can scan 10,000 pictures for as little as $100. And by the way, save 20% on their most popular service, their prepaid photo scanning box that includes same-day scanning and all extra add-ons. And to access it all, of course, the promo code is ExtremeGenes. That's ScanMyPhotos.com, promo code ExtremeGenes. Finally, a solution. Roots Tech 2019 may be over, but the Family History Fund doesn't have to end. Visit RootsTech.org to view recorded content from the event. Rewatch the inspiring keynote addresses from celebrity speakers Patricia Heaton, Saru Briley, and Jake Shimabukuru. A number of classes are also available to view for free from popular genealogists such as Miko Cleland, Diane Southard, and Valerie Elkins. Want access to even more content from Roots Tech? Purchase the virtual pass and get access to 18 recorded conference sessions. Watch playbacks from any device from the comfort of your own home. Enjoy exclusive content from popular presenters like Kenyatta Berry, D. Joshua Taylor and Lisa Louise Cook. Purchase your all access virtual pass at rootstech.org for only $129. Roots Tech 2019 may be over but it lives on through the Roots Tech virtual pass. Download yours today. Visit rootstech.org to learn more. And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And it's time once again for our Ask Us Anything segment. Today we're talking to my good friend Paul Woodbury from Legacy Tree Genealogists. He is the DNA specialist. Hey, Paul, how are you? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me, Fish. Hey, always happy to have you on and love getting these questions answered because uh, people are asking about this all the time. By the way, if you have a question for Ask Us Anything, all you have to do is email it to us at askusanything at extremegenes.com. So first question for you, Paul, variation percentages. You know, when people get their DNA ethnicity results... There are often percentages that were not expected. For instance, I had a friend who uh, had a, a grandfather who was fully Italian, but he came back only 8% Italian and a, a large percentage Greek, and he couldn't figure that out. What's going on there? So before anything, it's important to remember that ethnicity gives us broad context for your family history research. We pay a lot of attention to ethnicity because that's what's marketed. That's what's talked about. It's the the gateway drug, you know. It's the gateway drug, (laughs) yeah. And so we, we, we have a lot of attention towards ethnicity, but ethnicity is just for our broad context. It is a developing science, but it can still give us some important context clues. So in this case where we've got 8% Italian and then a large percentage of Greek, that really fits into the larger patterns of what we would expect 
with ethnicity because with ethnicity you're going to get different percentages at different companies and you're going to get variations on those percentages as those companies update their algorithms as they update their processes as they update the populations that they're referring your DNA against and that they're comparing your DNA to and so the ethnicity estimates that you have today the percentages that you have are likely to change in the next months years and coming time periods. And what you want to look at with your ethnicity estimates are those broad regional categories. The companies are very good at saying what is Native American versus African versus European versus Asian admixture. It's getting into the differences between populations and particularly between populations that have historically been tied to each other through migration, through common histories that you really want to be careful. In this case, 8% Italian, a large percentage Greek, that is all likely coming from their Italian grandfather. Yep. And it may be that that grandfather had one parent from one part of Italy and one parent from another part of Italy that was closer to Greece. And so if you actually look at the maps, it will also sometimes include indications that even though it's showing up as Greek admixture, it may bleed over into areas of Italy where mm -hmm. they're also seeing that admixture. And because Greece and Italy are neighboring countries, because they're both on the Mediterranean, because they both have a long seafaring history, we get some admixture of Greek and Italian between those populations. So just be aware that while the companies are very good at telling what is these broad population categories at the continental level, it's really hard to tell what's the difference between Italian and Greek, and it's really hard to tell what's the difference between British and Scottish, or British and Irish, or British and French. So <laughs> don't pay too much attention and don't get too hung up if there's a little bit of variation from what you might expect in those regions. All right, Paul. Great answer and a great question, and it's one everybody hears all the time. And we're going to take a break and come back and answer another one of your questions about why ants sometimes show up as first cousins. How do these things work? We're going to find out next as we continue with Ask Us Anything with DNA specialist Paul Woodbury next in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters' option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transferduplication.com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family 
family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for the Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. All right, it is time for our final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show for this week. We're doing Ask Us Anything, talking DNA today with DNA specialist Paul Woodbury from Legacy Tree Genealogists. And Paul, uh, this is one that comes up often, too. Why does my aunt show up as a first cousin? And that's a good question. I think a lot of people are confused by the fact there are similar numbers when it comes to various relationships. Exactly. What's important to remember is that the companies are necessarily broad in their estimations of relationships because the amount of DNA that you share with a parent is pretty clear-cut. The amount of DNA that you share with a sibling is also pretty clear-cut. But because the companies want to make sure that they're covering all potential possibilities, once you move into more distant relationships, they only are looking at the DNA and they're saying, well, this could be anywhere from a first cousin to an aunt to a first cousin once removed level of relationship. And as you move further away in your relationships, you get more overlap in the amount of DNA that you expect to share Mm -hmm. with those levels of relationships. So, Even though a parent-child relationship is clear-cut, a sibling relationship is clear-cut, a second cousin could share as much DNA as a first cousin once removed does. And as you get further out, they become more ambiguous and more blended. A fourth cousin could share as much DNA with you as a fifth cousin once removed or as an eighth cousin. As you get further out, the amount of DNA that you share is going to become more ambiguous and and helping you determine what level of relationship that could be. So important to remember that each of the companies are broad in their estimates. They'll say, you know, this is close family member, but then there's first to second, and then there's second to third, and then it's third to fourth, fourth to sixth, fifth to eighth, fifth to eighth to distance, you know, so they get more broad categories as you move further out. So when you see a close relative show up in a category that you're not expecting. The thing that you need to look for is, are they just sharing a really low amount of DNA with me, or is there a possibility of a half relationship? Right. Yeah. Right. And that can be scary. (laughs) As you, (laughs) you take this test and it comes back and you say, oh, no, why is my aunt showing up as my first cousin? Some things to help you interpret and to determine, are they really, you know, a half aunt, which would share about the same amount of DNA as a first cousin, or are they just sharing a really low amount of DNA and the company is being conservative in their estimate? And to help explore that question, I recommend DNA Painter. They have a tool called the Shared Senate Organ Project 3.0 Tool Version 4. <laughs> and that's available at dnapainter.com, and it's based on Blaine Bettinger's Shared Centum Organ Project, as well as some published data from Ancestry DNA to help you evaluate, if I plug in the amount of DNA I share with this person, what's the probability of particular levels of relationship? And that can help you often determine if it's more likely that they just share a low amount of DNA with you or if they are, in fact, a half relative. He's Paul Woodbury. He's the DNA specialist with Legacy Tree Genealogist. Thanks so much, Paul, as always. That is our Ask Us Anything segment for this week. If you have a question for any particular type of specialty, just send us an email. Send it to askusanything at extremegenes.com. 
Hey, that is it for this week. We are out of time. Thanks so much for joining us. Hope you got a lot out of it. If you missed any of it, of course, catch the podcast on iTunes, iHeartRadio, or ExtremeGenes.com. And don't forget to sign up for our weekly Genie newsletter. It's absolutely free at ExtremeGenes.com. We will talk to you again next week. Thanks for joining us. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 